been invited to give a testimonial sermon on my learnings from my 30-plus year in professional fundraising with Christian donors who modeled generosity. Notice it's not an exegetical sermon, is that the word, where you dissect everything? I'll leave that to the professionals. So it will be much more out of my own life and testimony. Bob asked me to do this the last nine years, and I declined. And I wasn't sure why. It's hard to say no to a husband. But I realized that uh, partly it was because uh, for many of those years, I was still active in my profession, which was a very confidential profession, as Heidi would know. It's something that um, you just don't always stand in front of people and talk about. But more than that, I realized that my journey was such hallowed, holy ground with donors that I hardly ever had the words to be able to put it into an experience of what I was experienced. It was that holy. Now that I'm three years into retirement and looking back over my career, I am just humbled that I had a front row seat to Anabaptist, for the most part, who lived their faith daily through a lifetime of generosity. It was a fabulous, fabulous seat. Before I look at the text and give uh, three donor examples, I want to give you a little bit of background into my fundraising career. I did not plan to be a fundraiser. I did not go to college to go ask people for money. The profession found me. I would never have thought that I would have been the kind of person who could have actually said to someone, would you give X amount of dollars? That's just out of my comfort zone. However, since the profession found me, maybe I should have gotten a hint. This wasn't a job. This was a calling. This was a calling. Additionally, as a little bit of background, I did not grow up in a home where financial generosity was talked about or openly displayed. We were incredibly generous as a family, such as we took in a mentally ill great uncle in my teen years who had to live with us. That wasn't pretty. But we were the generous ones in our family system who said, come on in. And mom and dad did model that for us. Every time, do you all remember when hobos showed up at the door, at least at the farm? When the hobo would come, dad would take the matches, rightfully so. We didn't want them staying in the barn with the matches. And my mom would give them a meal. Now, mom tended to burn a lot of meals, but they still ate it. It just, we gave them what we had. We were generous in that way, but never any mention of money. I don't know if mom and dad were generous with money or not, but we never talked about it. My personality type tends to be stingy. So, I would say that I come down with generosity here and stingy here, I'm over here, <laughs> on the other side of stingy. Why? I don't know. But it, it just is who I am. And so how have I worked at moving from a person who has a personality type of being stingy to being a wannabe generous giver? How did that happen? Well, God used my unpursued career to transform, challenge, and change me from the inside out, moving me from basically being stingy to striving for generosity. I'm not sure I'm ever going to get there. Some people are just born generous, you know, it just ekes out of them all over them. Some of us are like, oh, what about the future? We just can't do that. And so I don't think I will ever get the whole way there, but I, um, 
I'm basically on a journey, moving from being stingy to striving for generosity. The background scripture for today is the Matthew 25 passage, which was read for us, where the master gives out talents to his servants according to their ability. So we all have talents, and they were given to us according to our ability. We all know the story. The servants, some of them left go of fear. They invested what they could and produced good results for the master, except for the one who went out and buried it. You know, I've always sort of struggled with how they talk about the one that buried it. Have any of the rest of you ever struggled with that? I mean, at least he saved it. At least he had it to give back. But it's just pretty, I mean, it's pretty direct as to what's going to happen if you just bury it. So, out of this passage, I see that the biblical lesson that I needed to learn is whatever talent and talents, including money, you have been given, you need to do a couple things. Take a risk, get rid of fear, and use it or lose it. It's that simple. That's what they're asking there. We have to find a way to use the talents that God has given us. Across the board, the most asked question I encountered from generous donors was, and this was usually at the end of their lives, and I had walked with them about a 30-year period, and inevitably it happened to the ones who were the most generous. They would say, do you think the Lord will say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You have done it unto the least of these. That was the most asked questions question that I had at the end of um, a person's life. Additionally, I hear, oh, I'm sorry, at the end of their lives, looking back, they didn't care what kind of car they drove. They didn't care what church they attended. They didn't care what corporation they had started or had established. They only longed to be reassured that they were going to hear from God, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You did it unto the least of these. Additionally, in today's scripture, I think there's a hint that if you manage what you have, you will be given more. Now, that doesn't mean that you're going to be guaranteed financial freedom. That's the wrong use of that. That is not what it means. What it means is a sort of like exercise. You know, I'm not a very good person at exercise, but since I retired, I'm walking. And if I didn't walk every day, and now when I go into the cardiologist and I go into the doctors, they say, do you have an exercise pr size program? Well, I walk. I walk every day, and I do it faithfully for 35 to 40 minutes. Okay, you, I'm using it, and I'm using it, and I'm doing it all the time. That's a little bit what the financial freedom part is, I think, in this scripture. It's not guaranteed that you're going to be financially free if you are generous, but there's a principle there that when you give it away, there's something happens and you are given more to manage. And that's what our scripture shows today. So I have three donor examples. They're not living anymore, so I'm free to share it because when they are, I was extremely confidential with that. Uh, the large, and some of you have heard this exa these examples before, and I apologize for that just because um, it impacted my life in such a way. If you were in a small group, you've probably heard them before. The largest donor, the largest dollar donor amount I worked with, I witnessed being at a table where she gave checks totaling over $48 million over a 20-year period. That's a lot of money to me. That is a lot of money. She was a quiet, stay to herself orphan girl who needed to survive on mountain roots in order to have protein as a child. 
until the state of Pennsylvania came in, removed her from her home, and placed her at Millersville Children's Home, which was a Mennonite home for children who would be placed into foster care eventually. That was how she got to Lancaster County and eventually grew up Mennonite. During her lifetime, she was voted out of the country club because she didn't dress right, okay? She was excommunicated from the Mennonite church because she refused to hide the TV that she had in the 1950s. And I could go on and on and on of the examples that I could give from her life of how she could have chosen to be stingy and non-generous. Instead, she gave it over to the Lord and she became a very, very, very generous giver. One of the most holy moments in my career is when she talked to me about the painful excommunication from the Mennonite church over television. How many of us have TVs in our home now? Oh. During that conversation, I felt the Holy Spirit nudge me to ask her to forgive me for this wrongful action. Her response was, but you didn't do it. I said, but my people did. My people did. And I am sorry. We were wrong. Would you forgive me? She said yes. It was weeks after that holy act of forgiveness that I could hardly even come home and talk about that I received a call and she gave her first million to Lancaster Mennonite. I have to tell you something, folks. Forgiveness is unbelievable. Do we have any idea what can happen when we learn how to forgive one another? She forgave the Mennonite church for the wrong they had done. I never heard about it again. That forged a very special relationship with her. And I wish personally I had $10 for every time she would say, do you think the Lord will say to me at the end of life, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You have done it unto the least of these. That's one example of a person that help, is, helped me and is helping me move from being a stingy person to becoming more generous. The second example is a uh, woman very early in my career who I, uh, we were doing a, a very large building project, uh, the Auditorium Fine Arts Center at, at the school, and I sent out my first letter asking people for money, which is a little overwhelming to have your name on that letter, but that's what, that's what we were doing. And I got this personal note back and five $1 bills. And I thought, five $1 bills? And here was a note from a woman that said, I'm giving you what I can. I bless you in what you're doing. And I want the mission to go on. So I will agree to pray for you every day. Five $1 bills. Now this was 30 years ago, so I don't know. You accountants can translate that into what that would be today. Maybe 10 $1 bills, I'm not sure. Five. I was sitting at my desk, I got up, I took the five $1 bills and the note, I got in my car, which I was being paid mileage for, I drove to Ephrata, I rapped on her door, and I sat down with her. And I said, this is a tremendous gift. Thank you, thank you. She said, this is all I can afford. This is all I have to give. And I was so touched by that. And she agreed to pray for our project every day. I stayed in touch with her by phone, visited her maybe two or three more times. Never got another dollar, 
But those five dollars, I could hardly turn them over to the treasurer at the time because I wanted to keep them as a reminder that gifts that are given are not about size. It is about the intent. And it is about what God calls us to do. That woman helped me realize I probably uh, could have given $100 at that point and hadn't done so. I was embarrassed and I needed to move myself from being stingy to being more generous. Third example. Is there anyone in this room who has never stopped at Turkey Hill or eaten Turkey Hill ice cream? Can't quite imagine that there is. Well, Charles Fry was the co-founder of Turkey Hill, and he was the owner of the Minute Market section of, the, um, of Turkey Hill. And he was videoed uh, several years ago for his presentation at a building that he funded at LBC. And Charles's family has given me the authority to use a three-minute clip from that presentation. So we're going to watch Charles's words. He's a 90-year-old man. It is difficult to hear all of the words, so you're going to really have to focus on it. But I want you to hear his words as to how he decided to be generous his whole lifetime. Are we ready? When we uh, bought this business from my father, which was such a small business, it had two employees, I think. First, they had a meeting with my two brothers, Emerson and Glenn. We had a meeting on what is, how are we going to run this business and what's going to be the important things uh, in, in our life and in the business. At that point, we decided that we only going to take just enough to live on. So we decided that we would, we would pay these two drivers. We pay them $100 a week. And we would take $25 a week. So that's the decision we made to start out, to make sure that we had some profit to give to the Lord. My father, when he took me to church, when I was just five, six years old, he always gave me a quarter to put in the offering. And this was the way that taught me to give. And also, uh, at home, we always had family worship. And uh, if a telephone rang, it rang. Nobody answered. And we had family worship every night. So you can see with the way we were brought up and how we were taught at home, and then uh, taught to give, why I felt like that's the way the Bible found its way into my life. We said, that we are going to tie this business, and we're going to tie the 20% of the profits of the dairy, of the business, and our own personal profit, own personal $25 a week. So you see, 25 fell to 20 pretty quick. But that's the way we started the business. And as I look back, I see that as the most important thing most important decision that uh, we can make in order to show the Lord uh, that we want to run this business for Him. The Lord always honored our business and He always helped us to make money. And I don't think there's been a time in a business, in our business, any year that we did not make money. And so He blessed us he blessed us in uh, many, many ways. I never set uh, any, any level of attainment each year. I never set that in profits or in, any, in anything I wanted, wanted to achieve. I just lived it every day as hard as I could live it. And uh, just worked it every day as hard as I could work it. Whatever we get out of it, end of the year, fine. 
if we made a lot of fine, if we didn't make too much, we'd do it again. But we most always made a, made a lot of achievement and the gain. Where do we have Christian colleges? I miss him. But his influence is living on because of the many, many lives that he has affected, mine being one. Did you hear how he used his talents? He was very clear with it, if you understood the words. He let go of fear, which is what our passage tells us to do today. He invested his talents and money, and he just did it every day. He didn't, his business plan was not to set lofty yearly goals, and there's really nothing wrong with that. But his business plan was treat your employees well, and we will give 20% of our profits, both professionally and personally, to the Lord. This is how we will show. It was impossible for me to rub shoulders daily with persons like this and to remain stingy. My personal examples could go on and on, and many of you know them from this valley in particular, Norman and Elizabeth Hahn from Conestoga Wood. Again, holy ground in the wonderful way they've given their lives. Dale Calvin and Janet High from High Welding. David and Debbie Hollinger from Four Seasons who have funded overseas orphanages to India. John and Elizabeth Miller who gave their lives giving to others by multiplying their talents and over and over and over and over. And I don't know, do you think too, because they did well, they were given more? Most of them at the end of life would say, I never dreamed that I would get, be given that kind of responsibility. So let's have some takeaways today. What did we learn from scripture? Scripture's clear. We are all given a talent. We're all given money. We must give up our fear that's probably my number one and why I'm stingy. Bob knows that. Take a risk. Again, I'd rather have a sure thing. Risks seem difficult to me. But that's what we're asked to do, no matter what it is, whether we're babysitting, whether we're giving food, whether we're uh, supporting others. We have to do that in order to become generous in all areas. And I now find myself asking, as I get closer, I hope I have a ways yet, but wow, retirement, who knew it was here already? I'm starting to ask myself, what is God going to say to me when I get there? And I, too, want to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You did it to the least of these. It's very easy to give to people who have. It's harder to give to people who have not. There's a, a video that we're going to see for three minutes as our closing response song. It's not that well, it's not done that well musically, but I want the words and the tune to stay with you as you go this week.
Would you please stand for the benediction? Well done, thou good and faithful. Well done. Thank you. Cindy will join me at the back. Bob and Karen will be available in the um, room, overflow room for prayer ministry for anyone who desires that, uh, that ministry. People of God, go forth from this place.